Hey, this is Rob Unspun. Welcome to another edition of eHeroes. Today's eHero is Michael Dash. We're going to be talking about his book, Chasing the High. And, you know, welcome, Michael. And, and, and I think this is going to be a great uh, interview because a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, not only are they struggling, but, you know, they're, they're fighting addiction. They're fighting the government. They're fighting all these things. And your book kind of helps answer a lot of that. Well, thank you very much for having me. I mean, any time I'm introduced with the word hero, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, any any person who can uh, climb Mount Kilimanjaro uh, is is definitely. Here. Well, I don't know about you know, I don't know about that, but yes, I did <laughs> Mount Kilimanjaro, and it was one of the most fulfilling um, escapes, journeys, adventures of my life. I was actually raising money for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Uh, it was called Climb for a Cure. And um, yeah, it was about two years ago, two and a half years ago. And I climbed Kilimanjaro. It was, it was great. Anybody who has the opportunity to do it, don't brainwash yourself into thinking you can do it. Because if you put your mind and focus on it and follow a basic training schedule, you can do it. You don't have to be in phenomenal shape. And I would advise anybody to be adventurous, be curious, and try it. Now, was it something that uh, was on your bucket list, or you just uh, said one day, I'm going to do it? Well, you know what? I am the older brother who will never allow my younger brother to one-up me. <laughs> I know how that is. <laughs> so what happened is it started – with my brother running several marathons. I never had an interest to run a marathon. I was actually always a runner. I mean, my last name is Dash. I had no choice. So I was always a runner, but I was a sprinter. Like after one lap around the track of 400, I'm done. I'm like, I'm toast. But, you know, he started running these marathons and everything. And then I'm like, all right, I don't really like this. I'm going to run one. So I ran a marathon, which ended up being... Uh, kind of have an addictive personality. I ended up running four marathons in five years. And uh, it was all with Leukemia Lymphoma Society, team and training, their branch. I was running, uh, I was running marathons, doing something physically really good for myself, mentally very good for myself. Um, and then also raising money to benefit somebody else. That combination for me, there's nothing better than that. So um, so that's what I was doing with the marathons, but it all started because of my brother. So then my brother climbed Kilimanjaro, and um, I always had in the back of my head, if this opportunity presents itself, I'm doing it because, uh, you know, there's just no way I'm going to let my brother one-up me like this. And it came into my world, and like a friend was doing it, and as soon as she said she was doing it, I'm like, I'll do it. I'm like, let's do it. And then uh, I just jumped in. and. Here we are. Yeah, but your brother didn't write a book, did he? That's right. He's not one up in me. I'm the person of the brother sibling relationship that cannot be one up. I will not allow it. <laughs> so, how did the book come about? Well, you know, when you go, I've been through a lot of shit. And I don't know if this is PG rated or not. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> uh, that's great because I can bring my jersey out. You know, I moved out to California out here, you know, there's a little drop the F bomb. They're like, whoa. I'm like, you know, that's the way we talk back east. Um, but um, I wrote the book after several years and several mistakes and several lessons learned throughout my life, having dealt with addiction since the age of 11 years old, having dealt with lawsuits. I was in a six-year lawsuit with my ex-business partner after I bought her out. Um, having built a company and been an entrepreneur, you know, I had a recruiting and staffing company for 12 years before I sold it. I made a tremendous amount of missteps, of a tremendous amount of mistakes, and I learned from them. But it took me a long time to want to do any self-improvement, to want to look into myself. I was a high performer. You know, I, I mean, the company at one point was doing five and a half million in revenue a year. 
So like to like when you're when you're kind of you know building a small business, you're doing five and a half million. And you know, I was in Utah at the time, so I was like a big fish in a small pond. I'm like, what do you mean? Work on myself. But you just see the numbers, I'm doing five and a half million. It has nothing to do with how you're treating other people, with if you truly are fulfilled with yourself and your life, with if you are on the path that you truly believe will provide fulfillment. Because what I found out is that money did not do it. I was chasing the dollar every, well, my whole life. I had a gambling addiction, you know, it was all around money all the time. So, you know, when I got to a point where I was completely miserable in my company and had this huge lawsuit for six years that cost me $1 million in legal fees on top of, you know, 350K, which is what the lawsuit was about. It was a breach of contract case. When I brought my business partner out, I felt like she violated the contract. So that's how it started. But I was so in it from an arrogant standpoint, my ego would not, the five of the six years, would not allow me to lose, right? But um, that inability to have the emotional intelligence to realize that nobody really cares at the end of the day when you're dead and buried, if you won or lost this lawsuit, like move on with your life. You're destroying yourself. Nobody's doing it to you except you. Led to all these lessons learned, which led me to writing the book. Because if other entrepreneurs out there can learn something from this book, then they won't make the same mistakes I did. It could be a lot easier on them. And that was the point of why I wrote the book. And plus, I have some really cool stories. You know, 20 some years ago, I had a business partner and, and uh, you know, early on, you know, he, he was starting to give me problems. And so I saw the writing on the wall and um, but he was also having some other legal problems beyond the company. And so my attorney says, I'll make him an employee. And so we wrote up a contract. He was now an employee. And that came back and bit him in the ass when he tried to sue me. <laughs> Because he goes, well, I'm the partner. Yeah, but this contract says you're the employee. Yeah. He came in and stole half my equipment. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, uh, I could sue him. But, you know, I, I don't know how you would do, you know, go about six years doing that. Because to me, that would just be a, a, a giant drain on my life. And it was. I was growing the business and taking a loan out to buy the business in the first place. I was a mil I did pay a million up front. I only had half of that from you know working and saving money. I was always a very high performer in the sales arena. So I knew how to make money. I knew how to sell, right? My dad was an entrepreneur. I learned early on how to sell. Um, but my dad was always bad with people. And then he kind of transferred that to me until later in life when I learned all these lessons. So I was just trying to grow the company at the same time this lawsuit was going on. So I wasn't really, I was just like coming from a place of performance and anger and, and we're not doing enough. So I need more and more and more. I got to pay these bills. I was always focused on that. I was, I was just all over the place. Talk about chaos. That's how I ran my business in my life. And, yeah. you know, and I didn't work on myself. Even though I was actually doing some philanthropic things, like I had mentioned with running the marathons, raising money for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Again, those are all outward things. They're not doing the inner work on ourselves. And I didn't do that for a long time until about three years ago. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I think sometimes we're in the business for the wrong reasons and money becomes a central part of that. And we have to realize that it's, money is just a tool. Money is just the thing that gets us other things, but you know we we value that money above all else, and it can ruin us. Yeah, for sure, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, everybody. You know, we're we're brought up in a society with, at least for me, you know, and, and my parents and and the people I was around and my friends and the media. It's it's like we are like just kind of like sheep. To be frank, I mean, now is a perfect time to see the sheep. Oh, but 
in general, when we grow up as a child, we're not given choices. Like we're born into a religion and that's your religion, Mm -hmm. right? Like you go to school and graduate high school and go to college because that's what everybody's supposed to do. Graduate college and get a job and climb the corporate ladder because that's what you're supposed to do. Get the wife or get the husband and build the family because that's what you're supposed to do. Well, I say bullshit to all that, right? (laughs) You know, because... You know, there is a world out there where we can create anything we want to create. We can pivot in times like we're in right now, our businesses, to adapt to the world we're living in and go more online. We have the ability to create all these things. But when you don't actually know that you have that ability because you're shielded a certain way and your parents believe in a certain structure because they have been brainwashed also then you have no choice. But you know, there are so many successful CEOs out there who dropped out of college. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, now we're in this, we're in this period of time where, you know, businesses who have, you know, strived and sweated and, and poured, you know, their hard earned, you know, uh, money into building their business. And now they're deemed non-essential. And now they're told by the government, you can't work, you know, and, and, and so, you know, to me, I would say, look, if I was deemed non-essential, I'm going to find a way to work. I'm going to do whatever I have to do, you know, to, to, you know, keep my people working, to bring money in, to pay for the whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it, a lot of these people just kind of gave up and died. I, I don't understand it. You're an entrepreneur. Why aren't you doing something about it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is where we can add value to them. Hopefully some are listening to this podcast right now and understand that, you know, this is what I do, actually. I coach um, other entrepreneurs and executives. And I've been through 9-11. I've been through the housing crisis. I've been, I mean, we both have. We're probably, I think we're probably close to the same. I'm 50. I'll be 51 this year. So, yeah. Okay, so you got me by a few years, but we're <laughs> genre, right? We probably listen to the same music growing up. So um, um, we're in the same genre so, somewhat. And, um, um, you know, going through the housing crisis, 9 11, all these different things that a lot of entrepreneurs who are younger haven't been through, right? Um, the ability to adapt is, uh, I think, easier for us. So I think we've seen this before. We know this shall pass as well. And we know it's an opportunity to shift the business. You know, one of the things I did right away is my friend owns a $20 million nurse recruiting firm in New York City. As soon as this happened, you know, I talked to him. I say, hey, can I add any value to you? I know things are crazy in New York City right now. And he said, yeah, can you help me recruit nurses? I have 4,000 openings. I said, I'll give you, I said, look, I'll put my stuff on pause for a couple months because I want to create impact and help you. You know, I recruit 15 nurses for him that are working in New York and New Jersey. So it's just about adapting. And then if you have a business, you can easily bring it online. And if you can't charge for things right now, you provide them for free. You provide value for others and they will stay in your tribe or Mm -hmm. become part of your tribe. And then you flip the switch on and then you start charging and you built in that confidence and provided that value for them. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, you know, one of my, one of my friends, uh, and there's, there's probably one of these in every single uh, town, but you know, car dealerships, they can't sell cars right now, you know, and, and I'm in Pennsylvania and, and even the DMVs closed. So even if you could sell a car to somebody, you can't go get the title transferred, you know, so all these car dealerships are going, well, what do I do? I, you know, I, I can't have people coming in, you know, but a simple adapt, you know, adapting your website to the current technology, you can actually sell cars or get people to see the cars. You know, they don't have to come to your lot, but now they can at least see the cars. So when they're ready to buy, you know, uh, you're, you're, you know, you got things on reserve. Um, but yeah, they, the businesses just don't know how to adapt. They don't know how to take. Or, or think, you know, outside the box. I think they're learning. Yeah. <laughs> and if not, they're going to get left behind. 
Yeah, you know, even churches. Churches, uh, yeah. you know, were all deemed non-essential. We couldn't go to churches, so now they're all they're all learning how to use Zoom technology to broadcast their masses out there. Yeah. You know, so all I can say is I'm glad I invested in Zoom. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> they, they, a lot of these people, though, a lot of these companies have have had to deep dive into technology, and they've taken their businesses ten years in advance, you know, into the future because. They, they were slow to adapt to begin with. Yeah. No, I agree. And, you know, I talk about some of these things in my book, Chasing the High. Um, you know, I have a chapter called The Habit of Habit Making, which is extremely important, especially in these times, that we have the ability to incorporate new habits into our life, things we've never changed, things we've said, I don't have time. Right. <laughs> Because we all have time. That is some bullshit that we repeat and say to ourselves because we don't want to do it. That's the fact of the matter. We don't want to do whatever we're saying we don't have time to do. Because we all have time. That is the biggest fact. And I I was somebody who said that all the time. But I don't have time. I can't do it. But I I, I, I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to push myself. I didn't want to do the inner work. The inner work is so much harder than the right. outer work. You know, uh, for 20 years, I had owned a, a carpet cleaning business. And I always said, you know, because I was designing my own marketing, I always wanted to be, you know, a marketer and teach other people because they were coming to me anyway. And, you know, finally I said, you know what? That's enough. I've had it. I'm selling this business. And in 2013, when I rolled out my first book, I went full time in the coaching, and uh, you know, people come to me and they say, well, "How do you have the time to write all these books, to create all this content, to do this, do this?" I got the same time as you do. I'm just, you know, I'm getting up early. I'm getting stuff done. I have, you know, all my notes. I laid them all out. I have everything structured, and then by the time five or six o'clock comes around, I'm done. You know, I and and now I have content created for the next two three years, and people are like, "How?" You just got to do it. It's structure, focus, consistency, deliverability. Yeah. And, uh, and now, that, now that I have a system, it makes it so much easier to, to, to uh, push out books. Yeah. I mean, you know, I used to tell all my employees that regardless of what your job is, what you're doing in this world, failing to plan is planning to fail yeah very easy don't be lazy about it right. every night before you go to bed write down three things you want to accomplish the next day so you don't wake up the next day trying to figure out oh let me check my emails anything happening no write down three things no you know i have i have a notepad and there you go. It's got 30 some things that, that, uh, you know, and, and it's just pages and pages and pages of stuff that I'm, and I'm always going back. Okay. Did I do that? Okay. Cross it off. Yes. Okay. But yeah. it's my brain can only, you know, hold so much things. And, um, uh, you know, if I don't write it down, I'm going to forget. Yeah. The other thing is that, uh, another big tip that I always give employee entrepreneurs really actually, especially is time blocking. Time block is such a basic thing, but we forget about it. But blocking time off for specific tasks in our calendar will set us up for success and will set us up for focus. And even if you're in a, in a time of turmoil now, and let's say you don't have your business anymore, um, which I don't know why you, you wouldn't, right? But you should still focus and try to transition on it online. If anybody's going through that, I'm glad to you know talk to you. But uh, but if you don't, time blocking, even in your personal life, right, is extremely important and so easy for all of us to do. Put it in your calendar in advance, and your mind is then focused, so you wake up and boom. You know, you got two time blocks during the day to get some things accomplished, and, you know, you're going to be that, you're going to perform at a much higher level. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and uh, I, you know... For those people who say, you know, being an entrepreneur is all about freedom, and that's what I thought too. But it's also about responsibility, you know, and it's also about accountability to yourself. So 
It's yeah. not all about going out and going drinking and having fun and do that's all after, you know, but you know, you got to be accountable to yourself and, and grow your goals and, and make them happen. Yeah, hundred percent. And, you know, I talk about it in, in the, just to, you know, go back to the book, but I talk about my journey through addiction. You brought up drinking, so <laughs> <laughs> my addictions, but you know, I, I, I had a 20 year gambling addiction, you know, uh, an eight year cocaine addiction, um, a Adderall addiction, which I find amongst entrepreneurs, that's a big one, Adderall. Yeah, I, I don't do any of that, but yeah, I, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who do. And Adderall's a, a no no. Adderall, it, it, because it's legal, you got it prescribed and everything, you think it's okay, but it will really, uh, it, it controls your level of emotions, unlike any other drug I've ever done. And usually I'm do, I was doing it in the office and you know when i was it would just make me extra high strung so i treated my employees like crap for the majority of the time and you know i can look at myself honestly and say that i'm not proud of it but i am proud that i made the change in the last two years i ran my business i ran it from a place of empathy instead of from a place of correction and authority which is how i was leading it before and it's very important when as an entrepreneur that you lead from a place of empathy and collaboration versus authority and correction. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so how do they get your book? Where do they go? Yeah. So uh, my book's on audible. And if you want to hear this amazing Jersey accent, no Jersey jokes, um, <laughs> then you can find it on audible, but you could also find it on Amazon at chasing the high book.com. And on Audible, just pop in Chasing the High Michael Bash, and boom, it'll pop up there for you. And um, gotten a lot of great feedback. Um, there's a chapter in here on flow, uh, which is uh, and living in flow, which actually helped me transition my life from an angry, overworked, uh, addicted entrepreneur to uh, who was in a six year lawsuit <laughs> to uh, somebody who was able to sell their business, settle their lawsuit, write a book, and, and basically start over. And, and flow, that's a, a New Jersey concept, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. No, flow is definitely not a New Jersey concept. It's something that uh, for us back east, we probably look, excuse me, look at and think it's a bunch of she-she nonsense, but just like I did initially. But flow is really the premise of making decisions by following your intuition versus following your conscious mindset. I used to think, overthink, and rethink every single decision that I made consciously, and they always ended up in the wrong place. But when I followed my intuitive guide, some might call it their heart, some might call it their gut. When you have that feeling, it's never let me down. Yeah, It's always a fight between the conscious mind and the intuitive mind right? The intuitive uh, guy. And um, when I lead with intuition, I always end up in a fulfilled place. So basically, you know, when I met these people in flow, they were telling me about all these synchronicities in their life, how they changed their lives, how they were able to manifest their future. And, and like, if it's not a hell yes in your life, it should be a fuck no in everything that you do. And I was just like, what are these people talking about? This is some but I was in such a place at that time uh, of misery that I had set my, I had built a life that I was not happy with. And I was running a business that I came to hate. And I was in a lawsuit that never was ending. And I had these addictions that stop it. And so I took this course after meeting it with resistance. And it changed my life. We clear, you know, we worked on clearing limiting beliefs through tapping and EMDR, and these things that I thought were, were, were ridiculous and, and odd and weird, and they are. <laughs> um, they actually helped me and started shifting the way I made decisions and the way I ran my life. And I was able to get to a place to put my ego aside. And really work on myself, settle the lawsuit, sell the business, 
start over and write the book and 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 share the lessons I learned with other entrepreneurs and other people who might be coming across some of these challenges as well, and people in the company. Yeah, and that's what makes you an e-hero is, is you, not only do you put your ego aside, but you learned how to tap into the superpowers, and now you're sharing them out to the world. I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah, 100%. And anybody who's who might be going through anything, you know, I'm glad to offer anyone of your listeners a 45-minute free consultation call if interested. Wow. You know, in any of the areas that I just discussed, they can just email me at Michael at Michael G dash. It's spelled out D A S H dot com. And that's also your website. Yeah. Yeah. My website's www.michaelg-.com. If you want to check out a little bit about me, uh, you know, there's a, a free article that I po- that, that was published in Forbes called um, uh, Three Ways to Eliminate Chaos from Your Life. Uh, so, um, you know, feel free to get that for free on the website as well and check out my book. Well, there you go, everybody. Go check out uh, Michael's uh, book, Chasing the High, and go visit his website at michaelg-.com. And we'll catch you on the next episode.